This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Lena Cowan Orlin, professor of English at Georgetown University. Lena is a highly cited expert on private and domestic life in and around the time of Shakespeare. She has been the recipient of fellowships with the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEH, and the Folger Shakespeare Library. She is also an elected fellow of the Royal Historical Society, United Kingdom. She is currently a fellow at the Hagler Institute for Advanced Study at Texas A&M University, where she collaborates with faculty and students as the chair of the Board of Governors of the new Variorum Shakespeare. She is also the author of a recent book entitled The Private Life of William Shakespeare, which will be the main focus of this talk. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Lena, we have you in the house. You're here with us. And it is so good to see you. You're hard to catch up with. You're in London and Washington, D.C. But anyhow, welcome to our program. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. Yeah, and this from my Japanese colleagues and from our international audience and American audience too. But uh, I would like to move quickly to your book on the private life of Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, uh, and have you explain the unique approach that you took. But before that, I would like to say two things about your work. Beyond its focus on Shakespeare and specifically the Stratford Shakespeare, as opposed to maybe the London Shakespeare, the first is that your methodology as an archival researcher and acute interpretations as a cultural historian, the way that you present and manage what you identify as Shakespearean evidence clusters, a key word, evidence clusters, and in Shakespeare history that can be menacing, uh, they should be seen as a model that is transferable to countless other areas of cultural history, where we have been told Many of us when we were younger, some who are younger now, don't bother doing the work. It's already been done. Well, as you demonstrate and you punctuate in your text, no, it hasn't. There's much more work to be done. Now, secondly, as a supplemental benefit to gaining more insight on Shakespeare's life, we are also gifted with an exquisite view of the lives of regular people with insights into financial management or mismanagement, law, trades, glove making, I love the glove making, fairs, church, village life, quotidian life. May we ask you for an overview of your book? First, thank you so much. Tom, that's very kind. Um, so there are a couple of ways of approaching the book. One is as you've already suggested about the methodology which is archival, it's not a literary biography. The others in terms of content, and maybe I could just kind of go through, uh, there are five chapters in the book, go through each yeah. chapter, which basically argues. I should, I should say that not only is this not a literary biography, it's not a complete biography. As you said, it's centered in Stratford and Stratford records rather than London records. I spent a good deal of time in those archives and I kind of touched down Wherever it is, I found something that I thought might be interesting to explore. So that's the way, another way in which it's kind of incomplete. Um, in the first chapter, I start out with Shakespeare's father. The question that I had for myself was, why did Shakespeare not follow the same life path as his father? Um, why did he do something different? His father was, for many years, a remarkable success story. He'd grown up on a farm. But he succeeded in doing what to us would be like the first in his family to go to college. He moved away from the farm. He trained in town, as you said, as a glove maker. That was to enter the world of money, to have the opportunity to advance himself. He not only was successful as a businessman, he joined civic government. He became what's essentially the mayor of the town, a very important figure. But then in the early 1570s, everything kind of crashed down around him and he suffered 
business reverses. He withdrew from civic government. He basically went into a period of seclusion, which was to hide from his debtors. This happened when Shakespeare was about 13, which I think of as a formative age, just about the time that Shakespeare would have been thinking about the fact that he too would take up an apprenticeship, is not a, if not as a glove maker in some other trade. That would have been the expected path for him, just as he started thinking about um, indenturing his life for seven years, to spend seven years in a trade, a year or two setting himself up in business. His father suffered reverses that I think taught him that maybe this wasn't the path he might want to follow. And that's where I see a kind of major turning point in terms of his uh, breaking away from the path that would have been expected and where we see the first signs of the kind of self-determination that I see throughout his career. The second chapter is about how he did it. He would have been expected to be an apprentice. Apprenticeship indentures mandated that uh, the apprentice started about the age of 17 for seven years and with the regulation that during the term of the uh, indenture, uh, marriage he shall not contract, fornication he shall not commit. By the time he was 18, Shakespeare had committed fornication, had gotten his bride pregnant, had married, and although that is usually seen as a coerced entrapped marriage, I think that was his key to breaking his apprenticeship indentures, leaving behind the world of his father and being able to go to London where the public theater was located. Chapter three is about how he built the remarkable estate that he did, in which I again see his wife as a key figure contributing to the family economy. And there's a good deal of information about the businesses that she may have pursued in Stratford while he was in London as an actor and author. Chapter four is about his will, what he did with that estate. There are a lot of myths about the will, specifically that it was intended to express how much he despised his wife. I don't think from having read other wills of the period that there's evidence of that. and was not cut off with an old bed, as is frequently said. She was very well taken care of because she had dower rights to um, a third of the income from all the properties he had amassed for the, uh, for the course of her life. And um, it's also been said that the will preferred one of Shakespeare's daughters over another. I see him taking care of both of them. Um, and so it's, a, uh, to my mind, a much fairer, more thoughtful will than um, has generally been said. The fifth chapter is about his funerary monument. I expected this to be a kind of short coded to the book, but then I fell into a large research project of traveling around and looking at other monuments throughout England and real, realizing what was unusual about this one. If you have in mind the image of Shakespeare's monument, you know that it's a kind of portrait, head to waist, of showing him as a writer, quill in hand, paper before him. And um, it is modeled on a type that had originated in the Oxford universities for men of distinction. And it's a very unusual monument because it's not about his children. It's not about his wealth. It's not about his philanthropy. It's about what he did during his life that was worth remembering. I think the evidence is that he commissioned the monument himself, that he had a sense of how he wanted to be remembered, and that he recognized the importance of what he'd done as a writer. Well, that's all extremely interesting. And you've hit on pressure points for those of our audience or viewer, listener audience who are not into this. There are people out there who are deeply into this. And I know that you were on the uh, board of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust now. And this connection with Stratford is something that I think scholars like me and many others sort of miss because we get focused on the plays, the focus of the London theater and that sort of thing. But you can't, um, you can't ignore those formative years. And part of those formative years was an education. Now, I, I got a little lost. There's a lot of detail. 
and I got a little lost, but I think there's a guild hall. There was a guild hall and that somewhere attached nearby was the school that you could locate and the grammar education, of course, Latin. And also you point straight to Ovid. And uh, well, what schoolboy would be drawn to Cicero before Ovid, right? Uh, you know, there, there is, is sexy stuff. And also you get into London, you have all of these plays that are going and they're, they're using Golding, I, I have it here, Golding's <laughs> translation of, of Ovid's Metamorphosis. I mean, it seems to be the source text for so many plays, even you know, 20 years before Shakespeare was there, but uh, he goes straight to that in so many cases, but that formative period where you might be able to imagine someone transforming and realizing you know, I have other talents too, beyond this trade that I might inherit or apprenticeship. And I think it's a convincing argument that let's just take it, let's take it to the big city, like so many people have done, and so many examples of uh, people who go to Los Angeles and become actors, people who go to London to become actors or writers or New York to set themselves up as literary types. And so I think that was just beautifully done uh, in explaining how this young boy and young man gets into London, into the theater. Well, thank you. I mean, I think you hit on it when you were referring, when you mentioned Cicero as, for, as well as Ovid, because, you know, Shakespeare was lucky enough that in Stratford, that was what was called a free grammar school. That is grammar school that was available to the sons of free men, free men being men who were licensed to practice trade in the town. And his father was a free man. And so his son, his father's son had access to that school. And the purpose of those schools being set aside for men of business was to train up young men to take responsible roles as basically business leaders and civic leaders. It was to have them read Cicero, to learn how to be responsible citizens. But it wasn't, you know, only Cicero that was taught in the school. Ovid did come in, and I, that kind of, um, to my mind, is another way of talking about the two paths that he could have uh, followed. And Cicero would have taken him in the direction of his father. Ovid took him in the direction of the theater, the poetry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you show connections, too, throughout his London career, where there were these trips back and forth. It isn't a total abandonment, and it isn't necessarily... Uh, uh, a failed marriage and a separation that there are there's a there's a connection throughout and their visitations and uh, staying over in Oxford and perhaps uh, going to lectures in Oxford and there being uh, inspired perhaps for the monument that uh, I, there's a, uh, a cushion is, is that right when you think about monuments from the period there are basically three types one is the full figures laid out that's for you know, as if they're on their tombs looking towards heaven, that's the most famous type, a medieval type. Yeah. Uh, in the Renaissance, what became very popular was to show people kneeling in prayer, the emphasis on how religious they were. And they were not engaging with their viewers. They were engaging with a prayer book or with God. But then there was this very unusual type. It only lasted for 40 or 50 years of showing people full frontal, facing out towards the people who were viewing the monument, shown from head to waist, um, and, and they were portrait busts. There's a subset of that type, already a fairly rare type, a subset of that type that shows them with cushions at the waist. And this is what is the particular Oxford type, and which, to my mind, the, the, the fact that Shakespeare's monument also has a cushion uh, demonstrates its derivation from the Oxford type. Cushions were associated with uh, pulpits. That is, preachers would bring out a cushion to set on the pulpit to receive the Bible. And so cushions were associated with the men of Oxford who had trained in divinity, who were lecturing uh, on uh, religious subjects. And then it turns up in the monument of Shakespeare. And um, it's unusual in that context, but I think demonstrates that, as you said, when he was going back and forth between London and Stratford, overnighting in Oxford, he visited the Oxford chapels where these monuments were, and he heard these Oxford men, the greatest intellects of the day, lecturing. 
Well, I I know that it was I, I, I I'm assuming this. There is very little mention of the plays and the content within the plays. I think there are a few titles in there, but I I, I you purposely avoided that. I think, and I think I know why is because there's so many cases in the in the huge long history of Shakespeare scholarship where someone extracts a line and says, okay, this tells us something about Shakespeare. And they go into this authorial intention. And I, in my career, have always pushed back against intentionality. We don't know. These are dramas. Uh, if it says Shakespeare and audio, autobiography, okay, maybe. But these are dramas. However, I'm going to break the rule uh, because when I got to the monument section, I remembered uh, Laertes' line of the, about his father, no trophy, sword, no hatchment, or his bones. And then later, Claudius tells Laertes, I'll give you a living monument in Hamlet. And I started searching, you know, we can do that now for monument in Shakespeare. It's, it's pretty prevalent. Uh, the, so I'm, I'm not making a connection there, but I think that Shakespeare speaking to the society that he's in, always speaking to the audience and so forth, monuments were a big deal. You couldn't expect for your life to be preserved in written text or anything. If you didn't have a monument, you went into a common burial into the dirt at a parish church or at St. Paul's, and that was it. And that's why Laertes is so upset about Ophelia and his father. So this is part of the culture. So it, it, we might see it now as a little egotistical or maybe a lot e egotistical, but if you want to be remembered, you have to have a monument. Yeah, you know, it's, it's true that I tried to stay away from making connections between the life and the works for exactly the reasons you said. The one place I was really tempted was the monument. And that's because of another part that you didn't mention, but also Hamlet, which is that the top of his monument, it's a very symmetrical monument. At the top of it, there are two Puti cherub figures who are shown as grave diggers. And they're resting after their labors, having turned up, they're sitting on mounds of dirt. Um, and so it's a reference to the fact that Shakespeare has now uh, been interred in the dirt himself, but one of them, in spite of the symmetry, one of them is distinguished by having turned up a skull in the dirt. Um, and uh, so that's, that's where yeah. it was hard for me not to mention Hamlet. But I did avoid it for exactly the reason you said. It goes back, the very first biographer of Shakespeare was Nicholas Rowe, the playwright and the first editor of what we would call a modern edition of the collected works. And he included a short biography. He justified doing that by saying that some understanding of the men's life could conduce to a better understanding of the works. He was the, basically the last person to say that because almost immediately the man who was supposed to be writing the second biography, William Olds, did the reverse. He read Sonnet 93, which refers to living like a despised husband. And even though it's a fictional sonnet, even though it's using a simile. He said, surely this is indication that Shakespeare was suspicious of his wife, that Shakespeare had cause to believe that she was unfaithful. Edmund Malone, the next great editor of Shakespeare, came along, picked that up. He knew that Sonnet 93 was not written about a woman at all. It was written to a young man. But he said, you know, Olds, nonetheless, must have been on to something. After all, is not jealousy the motivating factor in four of the, of the, of the four or five of the great tragedies? Now, again, I agree with you that I think jealousy is a great motivator for drama, that the motivation for including that theme is the action that it sets in play and that Shakespeare was thinking of dramatic energy, maybe more than his personal life. I don't think we can ever know, or I, at least I know that I can never know when or if he was writing autobiographically. And so I tried to stay away from making the kind of connections that um, are usually the business of literary biography. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and some speculation is uh, allowed in, in those uh, circumstances if enough evidence is provided. But this goes into another thing 
I, I kind of want to get back to Shakespeare's marriage, but I want to go first into the and let our uh, viewer listeners uh, know what what you have to plow through. Uh, you're dealing with a, a thousand piece plus jigsaw pu puzzle anyway, probably far more that's been uh, toyed with over centuries of very, in some cases, very uh, overtly, perhaps overconfident, but certainly self-confident men uh, in the 18th century, 19th century, who will just come out and say, this is it, you know, in that sort of oratory style in their writing, and they, uh, I've found it, and this is it, and then it becomes doctrinaire. And then it, it seems it becomes a monument itself. It, it seems impossible to tear down uh, because as soon as somebody does, somebody else goes to the text before and it gets picked up again and they yeah. miss the, the, the next critic. And then there's more archival evidence that's found and missed by the next person. And it reminds me of uh, Richard Altick, one of my favorite ever books, uh, The Scholar Adventurers, right? And there's a section on Marlowe in there. The, the similar thing, of course, happened with Marlowe. And uh, this happens, and you have to get through that, and that's your, uh, that, that's your evidence cluster there. Because some of what they're saying can be right, and other things, you have to separate those things and then set them up for us, as you have done. Thank you. You know, um, one of the great pathbreakers in... 20th century Shakespeare biography, a great name, Sam Schoenbaum, because you'll remember that he did a couple of books drawing together the records to try to create a documentary history. But if you look at Schoenbaum's book, which is full of illustrations, beautiful illustrations of the documents that he worked with, you'll notice that often he includes what we would now, kind of trained by Google, refer to as a snippet view. That is, he'll take a whole document and he'll just cut out the little bit that has Shakespeare's name mm -hmm. to show the, that, that Shakespeare existed in this document. And what I tried to do was to read the whole document, not just the little snippet that so many of us have concentrated on for so many years. And then beyond that, to read other documents in the same genre. Because what I've discovered is that if you read any document in isolation, you often don't understand why it was written, what the conventions were for the creation of that document, what its own rules were, what vocabularies it used, um, who it was intended to persuade or what it was per intended to document. And um, that's what kind of led me into the more archival path that you have discussed, which is just to read a lot of documents um, in yeah. search of understanding what the ones that deal with Shakespeare mean yeah or whether or not it was a forgery by john payne collier <laughs> and <laughs> i had to deal yeah. with collier in my early days of research oh that guy and uh and he did some wonderful work but you just sometimes a lot of times you don't know uh from Schoenbaum's uh shakespeare's lives i remember uh that character halliwell phillips and oh, yeah. uh and the wallaces from Nebraska, yeah. and you it's just unforgettable how driven these people were. Collier, a sort of um, officious librarian who wanted to make his librarian, who wanted to make his uh, name earlier on, and then later, Halliwell Phillips, who takes the name of his wife, the surname, and I believe his father-in-law was also a Shakespearean, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I made a couple of important discoveries, actually. Yeah. His father-in-law. Yeah. yeah, and then in early 20th century, Wallace and his wife going repeatedly to London and spending 15 to 18 hours a day pouring over records over and over again. And they made a discovery about the will uh, that was very important, I believe, or some other. It was, yeah, they, they discovered a case uh, that actually was in one of the courts. It's a legal case where uh, Shakespeare had been the lodger, you know, when he was in London, this, this has to do also with the fact that his home base was always Stratford. Stratford's where he returned, Stratford's where he bought property. When he was in London, he lived in lodgings. Yeah. And it was, it was, he was as, a, he was living as a lodger in a household where an apprentice and the householder's daughter got betrothed. There was a disagreement about the contract and Shakespeare was called in as a witness. 
That's the case that the Wallaces discovered with Shakespeare's deposition filed right. in that filed in that law court. Yeah, the will, um, the will had long been discovered, but the uh, but this yeah. addendum to the life, yeah. Yeah, but you're but you're right. You know, Collier, Collier is kind of you know the the perfect example of the frustration we've had about uh, how little information seems to remain, how much we feel that the historical record lets us down, how much we still want to know that we can never be satisfied. And so, you know, Collier, having made a few discoveries himself, got frustrated and started creating them. <laughs> so, <Just> make them <laughs> up. <laughs> and Hallowell Phillips was just maniacal. Um, he left behind hundreds of scrapbooks and scrap boxes into which he was, you know, pasting or dropping little pieces of paper about different threads that he would follow uh, in Shakespeare's life. He was aiming to write a biography. He never succeeded in doing that. He basically published his collections of like individual case studies of the documents that he had turned, turned up. The Wallaces, as you said, summer after summer, somehow they persuaded Nebraska to let him go to London, give up teaching, supported him in his quest, because he said, you know, if he didn't do it, a Harvard man might beat him. To a Harvard the, man might get, the, get in there ahead of you. Yeah. And that seemed to be a persuasive line. But they, too, in spite of the important discoveries they made, and they did make not only this legal case, but also evidence of uh, uh, some theatrical companies in the period, they too wound up feeling unsatisfied, frustrated. Um, it's a, it's a you know, constant theme through the biographical research that has been done for, you know, since 1709 in Nicholas Rowe. Yeah, the Wallaces, it, it, the, that biography has stuck with me through the years because uh, something, I don't know, in Texas, somehow he had some land in Texas and they discovered oil and he became rich, according to Schoenbaum and others. And he just abandoned everything. After this, these years of obsession, he just left and went to Texas and died. And, and, and I wondered, you know, if there was a long lost uncle that somewhere along the way had said, well, uh, Tom, you, <laughs> you don't have to do this anymore. You know, you're, you're a multimillionaire. Would that be a, some kind of curse, you know, to take away whatever it is you, you think you love? I don't know. We could explore that. But I do want to go into the marriage because people really have gotten stuck on the bad marriage motif. Uh, with the second bed or second best bed, I think is is right. And that bit, and they just latched onto that. And that lasted for hundred, over a hundred, maybe 200 years. Uh, I, I don't know, a long time. And yeah. you, you've gotten around by, this uh, uh, yeah. by looking more closely. Yeah, by 1832, it was said, you know, the one thing we know definitely about Shakespeare was that he hated his wife. He was in an unhappy marriage. Yeah. There was a man by the end of the 19th century who got so exercised by how miserable Shakespeare must have been that he wound up saying, wouldn't it have been better if one of them, even if it'd been he, had died before that horrible marriage happened, you know, which is a little bit perverse because we wouldn't have any Shakespeare plays, we wouldn't have any Shakespeare poems, all sacrificed to uh, the desire to avoid how terrible that marriage was. <laughs> Um, it, it, the marriage, the, idea, the myth of the marriage is an example of an evidence cluster, which is, you know, where you started when, 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 where we first started, you put together the fact that she gets a second best bed in the will with the fact that she was older than he, with the fact that she was pregnant when they married, with the fact that he spent a lot of time away from home and with the fact that in Twelfth Night, Orsino advises that a man should take a wife who's younger than he, with the fact that those four or five tragedies and are you know motivated by marital jealousy, and you come up with the idea that Shakespeare was unhappy in his marriage. As you said, um, I really, read this differently 
the place that I started with all this was the second best bet. I am interested in daily life, quotidian life in the period. And one of the places I went to try to understand it was to start reading wills. They're a wonderful genre, especially when they're not formal documents taken down by scribes, but wills that are taken down bedside orally as people are dying, they're full of personality. They're full of information. It's wonderful to hear the voices of people who've left no other trace on history as they're you know, facing their end. And so I just started reading wills for the insights it gave me into how people thought about relationships with their family, with their uh, friends, how they felt about their possessions, um, how they described their possessions, how they thought about them. And as I did so, I came across a lot of second best beds and third best beds and fourth best beds. And there was one woman who had seven sons who had first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh best bed. And she gave them, you know, each child, presumably, I think, in order of age. The, the, rank, um, the ranking of beds, <laughs> it just is sort of foreign to us, but there you are. Yeah, and you know, it was just, again, this is to get back at the idea that different documents had their own language. It was just a common language. Um, it turns out not only in wills where people are saying, I want him to have, when they say third best bed, it might be the bed that didn't have the four posters. It might be a bed that had a straw mattress rather than a feather mattress. You know, there are different ways of understanding how a, one bed was more valuable than another. And that's what it has to do with. But it, the language is so common that even in inventories, which are where um, people come in and analyze, you know, appraise the value of everything somebody owned after his death for the law courts, they would, in inventories, refer to the best bed being worth whatever, and, you know, a pound, and the second best bed being worth 18 shillings or whatever. So I saw a lot of those things, and I never saw any second, third, fourth, or worst bed given as an insult. And worst is also a common descriptor for beds. So somebody would give his heir a house, his best horse, his best cloak, his worst bed, his sword. You know, it's just something that turned up on the list, list of goods and was a way of identifying the one that he wanted to give. And what I concluded from that was that Shakespeare wasn't um, insulting his wife with that gift and that everybody in the family would have known which bed was the second best bed. It was just, you know, a kind of common language that people used. Uh, so it really just doesn't, you can't draw so much meaning from that. And also there was more to the process of making the will uh, that you pointed out. And I think there's some argument that Shakespeare, uh, how is it that a poet seems to be so terse and, and unemotional? Uh, and a lot has been gathered from that, that maybe it's just call, trying to cull too much from just one shred of a document there, where there would have been other documents that accompanied it, right? Yes? Well, I also, the other thing is that, you know, Shakespeare had had an awful lot of opportunity to express himself in writing. And a lot of people who are writing wills are not people who've expressed themselves in writing. And that's kind of their opportunity. And so they do get expressive. Some wills are very expressive, uh, describing relationships, explaining why I did this and not that. The explanations usually come when somebody is doing something unexpected. Mm -hmm. I have to explain why I'm giving something to this son, even though he's estranged. I have to explain why I'm not giving something to this daughter because I don't like her husband, things like that. Shakespeare doesn't feel that he needs to make any explanations. So I don't think he thinks that he's doing anything unexpected. And the other thing is that I think we should think about Shakespeare as a master of genre. And he understood genre and its demands. He understood the genre of the will. He understood what it needed to do. And he was focused on what the will needed to accomplish in terms of uh, distributing his estate and protecting his heirs in the way that he wanted to. Yeah, you, you would think that in that case, he goes, well, one thing we don't need here is uh, naughty uh, imagery within iambic pentameter, where, you know, we leave it up to the audience to interpret in certain different ways. Now, this has to be very straightforward. 
and um, and so and so there we are. Well, what I would like to do, and we can uh, come back to the book, but I do want to let uh, our audience know that you have been working on private life for years now, and you have two other books on this matter and other articles, and that's led you, and I'm going to be selfish here because I have a couple of questions about the uh, Stratford birth, uh, birthplace, but uh, you it's led you uh, happily, without having to secure, <laughs> without having to spend fifteen to eighteen hours a day, you you've been able to travel in England and look at houses, and study the. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming the 16th, 17th century, the Tudor design. The you know has been so internationalized, but you know a lot about houses and the differences within thirty years or twenty years of how styles. Uh, it changed. And I had a question about Tudor houses, because when I went to the, the birthplace trust the last time a few years ago, I noticed that the wood was painted, uh, that usually in what we think of as Tudor design is exposed beams. And I was told by an official there that no, in the Tudor time, they painted the wood. And is that true? The interiors were much more decorated than we generally think of. And sometimes it's painting what they call wall painting. Yeah. And in a half timbered house might mean that the pattern was basically on the paneling and, you, you know, the, there wouldn't have been a lot of painting on the wood timbers themselves, on the beams themselves. It would have yes. been on the bits of plaster in between. Um, sometimes it was wall uh, coverings so that it was cloth that was painted and hung on the wall, but they were very decorative and very colorful. Um, yeah. Even in um houses that we would think of as you know laborers farm pe people could still have wall coverings that brought color and decoration into their home well, what about on the outside would they have left those beams exposed to the weather and so forth or would they have it's a combination some were some weren't some of them were coated with lime or something basically the intention was to protect from rot from water um, but then there also came a practice of sculpting the uh, plaster on the outside of houses in shallow relief. It's called pargeting, and the sculpting could be could be painted so that too was colorful. Um, I think it, you know we we inherited the kind of stark black and white from the Victorians. They were the ones who emphasized that in their recreations of Tudor and Stuart houses. Okay. But I think that the whole scene would have been a lot more colorful than 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 they thought. Okay, okay, that that explains a lot. Uh, I've, I've always wondered about that. I had a friend uh, years ago, he's a real estate developer. And I talked about someone having a Tudor style house. And he said, real Tudor or fake Tudor? And I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, what you're talking about probably is fake Tudor, and even more fake Tudor in the um, in the American suburbs or uh, uh, whatever. But uh uh, there were, yeah, so, uh, so, so real Tudor is where the contrast between the wood and the plaster infill is structural. You need the beams to support the house. Yeah. Fake Tudor is where you're putting up pieces of wood to make it look like it's, uh -huh. it's got that contrast. Uh -huh. Or pieces, I think he was talking about pieces of siding that looked like it was wood. Uh, oh, so, wow. <laughs> so that would uh, uh, be uh, something there. Well, uh, I... I wanted to move uh, into your work and make sure that we can cover, have time to cover this, that uh, you also do art history and visual arts. And you have what I think is a new appointment at the uh, Haler Institute for Advanced Study at Texas A&M, which has such a fine digital humanities based faculty, but also just fine scholars uh, uh, along with that. And you're working there and tell us about what's going on uh, and uh, it has to do with the uh, text that is being in uh, variorum am i right yeah that's right um people who are shakespeare scholars will know the new variorum editions of shakespeare which you know date back to well the ones that we've been working with to the 19th century and to the furness family and what a variorum edition sets out to do is to show you line by line through the text, every intervention that an editor has ever made in a text, and then to give commentary note on that line. 
every time that it has been referred to, explicated in criticism. So there are massive um, amounts of research that go into this project and they digest research for anybody who's interested in a very close and careful analysis of Shakespeare. There is a, the 20th century version of the New Variorum editions um, were sponsored for years by the Modern Language Association. And recently, five or six years ago, the MLA decided that it needed to find another home for the New Variorum Shakespeare, and specifically a home that was digitally networked in a way that would support the production of um, a, a new variant of Shakespeare for the 21st century. And I got involved in the committee that was trying to find that new home. And with my fellow committee members, we finally uh, found Texas A&M University and its Center of uh, Digital Humanities Research, headed up by Laura Mandel. And they are in the process of revolutionizing what had been massive print volumes into a digital version, an electronic version of the new Verarm editions, which if you think about it, if you have a line that's keyed to every textual definition, every critical commentary note, that's kind of a kind of hypertext before we could create hypertext digitally. Right. There's a way in which the very arms were always aiming to something that they weren't technologically capable of being or understanding. So the, in many ways, the very arm is, is now developing into what should always have been had we had the technology, its ideal form. And the team is producing this, uh, these digital editions, um, open access, free to all, so that as editions, you know, of individual plays get added to the collection, it's going to be a remarkable resource, a kind of place of first resort for somebody who wants to understand what the history is of the way in which Shakespeare text has been interpreted and of all the possible variations in which that text has already been interpreted. Yeah, and you're with the right people there. Uh, because this is not easy. I know something about the technology and how that would be set up and how one might uh, try to set up systems of links to this or that. But uh, you, you have to have someone and you do have people who will be very understanding of uh, the, what the user encounters coming into the Shakespearean text and, and not get them confused as they're wandering here and there. Uh, and setting up the uh, the code, you know, behind the interface in a way that makes things um, uh, fluid and uh, usable. So I am very excited to hear about that. And uh, I might have to talk with a couple of people over there and find out what's happening oh. on the, the code. Yeah, yeah, I hope you do. Um, the MLA has done an enormous amount of work. They did sponsor the original coding process. So the coding was was set up uh, before the, it, it came to Texas A&M. A&M has been creating the interface, the design for the way in which we encounter all this information. And there, you know, it's in the process of beta testing and there are, if, if you do invite somebody on um, from the Texas A&M team, they'll be able to show you the development of the project. And as I said, MLA recognized that they wanted it to be a fully uh, in, in the kind of environment that would support this kind of work. Yeah. Texas A&M is also the home of the World Shakespeare Bibliography. I think you've had Heidi Craig on. Perhaps that's she right. talked yeah. about that in the past. Yeah. And so that's one of the uh, partnerships or networks um, into which the uh, New Variorum is being imported. Yeah, well, and you seem very excited about this, and uh, I, I understand why now, uh, and uh, because you're, you're getting support, you're getting a dedicated staff of scholars rather than, well, I'm sure that you have to use graduate students to do a lot of the work, but you have to have that dedicated staff who have continuity in, in going through these uh, uh, variorum. And uh, I, I will talk to uh, one or more people on that faculty uh, because we're very interested in digital work over here because in my time, whatever, 24, 25 years in Japan, I have uh, started out with nothing 
and it's just opened up more and more uh, what is available online, what I have access to, whether it's the, you know, uh, some years back, uh, EBO database and other types of archival, uh, the British history online, the, the kinds of things you go, oh, I can do this project I want to do now, almost 90% sitting here. I still need to go and check out things in the library, whether it's the Bodleian or the Folger. But uh, uh, this digital revolution of the past 20 years uh, and more, actually, uh, has benefited scholars, not just me in Tokyo, but in remote places, even in the States. You know, not everybody is across the road from a, uh, you know, world-class research library. So that's just wonderful work that you are doing. Well, I wanted to go back a little bit in your career and talk about your uh, work at the Folger Library. Uh, the Folger is a friend of the program. I've spoken with Eric Johnson there, who is the uh, head of the digital access. I'm very interested in, and uh, our university, we're working to digitize some of our texts. Very small, a uh, hot dog stand next to a very orum Shakespeare. But uh, we have some rare books and uh, Bibles, actually, Bibles that are uh, of interest. So we're sharing on their platform. We're digitizing them here but we don't have the resources to build the kind of thing that the Folger has the resources to build. So uh, you worked uh, as, and I'm, uh, you were with the Folger for years. And uh, tell us about yeah. that work, yeah. Yeah, that was, my, that was my first job. I started working at the Folger actually before I'd finished my dissertation. Um, I worked as exec executive director of the Folger Institute, which was the arm of the library that uh, sponsored uh, research seminars, conferences, uh, advanced academic programs. And so we brought people in from all over the world to lead seminars from a wide geographical range in the States to take part in seminars, conferences, and so on. And it was, it was um, wonderful work, especially because it was interdisciplinary. So um, I had written a dissertation in uh, English studies. My PhD was in English, but I worked a great deal with historians. I learned a great deal about archival research from historians. I learned how to read English handwriting in the Folger from the head of the manuscript division. Um, so it was, a, it was a wonderful kind of continuing education, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah, what a fortunate thing to to be able to segue, get to get out of graduate school. You were in a department, I think if I'm cross-referencing correctly at uh, Chapel Hill that uh, was very historical in their approach. Uh, there were, yeah. uh, there's some very famous names who were there at that time and uh, who still are there, but I mean, the uh, not them necessarily, some of them have uh, passed on, but the uh, that, that was a, uh, a good place to train if you wanted to become a cultural historian in literature uh, because they didn't see how you needed to separate that. Uh, and, yeah. 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 My thesis advisor was Alan Dessen, who, you know, yeah. primarily for his work with, you know, very um, detailed, close reading of stage directions and what you could learn about stage practices from kind of, you know, implied stage directions in the text and from the printed stage directions. And so he was a, a, a kind of pathbreaker in close reading of early modern texts in that way, historical way. Was, was Hinman still there when you were there? No. Uh, he'd gone, I think he went to Kansas. Uh, he, I think, well, uh, maybe off camera, a couple of Hinman stories, uh, but uh, <laughs> there's, there's a, a good bit of bibliography. I mean, people who, if you think that the kind of archival research and detailed research that your advisor and other people and that you do is something, there are these guys, uh, well, there's one story I can tell uh, of how his bibliography was proofread. And I don't know, it could be apocryphal, but sitting down with the graduate st the student and reading each word backwards from the back and then repeating oh, yeah. it forward, every word in however yes. many pages. Uh, and, uh, I was told that story by a bibliographical scholar, Trevor Howard Hill, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he, he told it very seriously. That's what they did to proofread it. And I was sort of like this. He goes, well, <laughs> it does seem a little bit obsessive, but, uh, but that's what they did. And they didn't have spell check. They had to go into those, you know, yeah. you wrote it out. In some cases, I guess you wrote it by hand and then typed it and then had to check it. 
but there's some great stories in uh, bibliography and uh, archival research from that period. And uh, well, and he went, you know, he went on to create what's called the Hinman Collator, the Hinman which is Collator. you know where you can where you can lay two texts side side by side in the machine. Uh, makes it easier for you to recognize the differences between the two texts. Yeah, you know, it goes back to what you were saying though about how much you're able to do now, thanks to the digitization of resources. It's yeah. a different world. It's yeah. just, you know, I, I mean, I felt I, I had exactly the same kind of sense of wonder and gratitude when I was working on the biography that so much information is available online now. Yeah. One of the Folger resources that's been set up is the website Shakespeare Documented, which has a yeah. few hundred of the key Shakespeare documents beautifully photographed. You know, you can expand them to look at those texts in, in close up in great detail. They're just gorgeously um, shown. Um, Ebo, absolutely. Hottie Trust. I mean, the way where I was able to read Hallowell Phillips and any number of 19th century biographers was because all that stuff has been digitized and is available online. I didn't need to go into um, a library to find it. So, uh, you know, I, I needed to be in the archives for the manuscripts that I was working with, but all the kind of contextual material and surrounding material is available to us all now. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, not everybody has access to Ebo. Um, but certainly Hottie Trust is making inroads even with some 16th and 17th century volumes to help make them more widely available. Yeah, well, I'm working on some stuff now and I've been discouraged by the fact that I'm not sure how to do it because it has to be visual. And I think that you've probably, have, you're so descriptive in your work, but I, and, and there are plenty of uh, illustrations or there are plenty of, uh, uh, figures and, and so forth in your your work and it would it would be wonderful at some point to be able to do some kind of supplemental thing uh, digitally where you can zoom in and and get uh, a bigger you know a picture of a map on a page is far different than having a, yeah. a digital recreation where you can zoom in and focus um, I talked with Janelle Genstad at the map of early modern London which I've used a lot and it it, it gives you such a sense of the city. If there were a similar thing for Stratford in the, in the 16th century, that would be wonderful too, because there was a fire and, uh, and a very important part of, of your book uh, has to do with that fire and the birthplace trust uh, and how that may have changed the shape of Stratford. Yeah, there were there were two fires actually in in two succeeding years, 1595 and 1596, and they were terrible. Yeah. Um, they were they were bad enough that representatives of the city went to London and got permission to travel around the country, appealing for contributions to help rebuild the city. The losses were so great. It was buildings. It was the contents of buildings. It was equipment. If you know, if you were a glove maker, for example, you may have lost all the leathers that you were processing, the dyes that you use, the equipment that you use to cut the leather uh, and so on. So, it, you know, it was a terrible loss. Um, there were basically two kinds of domestic property in Stratford. One kind was owned by the Lord of the Manor. Another kind was owned by the town, each of them renting out to the people who were occupying houses. The manorial records are almost all lost. They were destroyed. The best records we have which are for properties that were owned by the town because the town was taking a census. They were losing income because people weren't able to pay their rent mm -hmm. when their houses and livelihoods were destroyed. And so they were very concerned about the financial impact of it, which is why we have records for that side, that kind of property in town. Unfortunately, John Shakespeare, Shakespeare's father, for our purposes, unfortunately, for him, quite fortunately, had rented from the manor rather from the town. So we don't have explicit information about what happened to the building that we call the birthplace because those records are lost. Right. Nobody, right. Has, ever, nobody has ever wanted to believe that the fire, which was demonstrably on the other side of the street, crossed the street, that it went from the south side of, the, of Henley Street to the north side of Henley Street. But there is evidence that there were buildings that were burned out on the north side of Henley Street. 
And I believe that the records show that the building we call the birthplace was badly damaged in the fire. At the least, the building itself is characteristic of architecture of the first decade of the 17th century, hmm. not of 1564 when Shakespeare was born. Right. And so I think that it's on the site of the house that Shakespeare was born in, but is not in whole the building that Shakespeare was born in. In fact, I think this is more exciting, more interesting in a way because it's a building that he would have overseen the rebuilding of. Oh, in other words, goodness. this was his inheritance. He inherited the building from his father and um, it exists as it was created during Shakespeare's lifetime, you know, as an adult, uh, rather than uh, the building that he uh, was born into as a, you know, as an in and, and lived in as an infant. Yeah, this just goes to a kind of uh, false consciousness that I've been uh, part of too, thinking that something from the 14th or 15th century, as you travel Europe or England or, or so forth, uh, the, uh, there, there's so many experts that have gotten so good at historical reconstruction, not not digital, but in the actual reconstruction, that the uh, the people who visit go, oh, this is what it must have looked like then, and very often it is, but you can only be so exact. And any house, as we would know in our own lives, any house, any any structure goes through changes in very yeah. short periods of time. So you can only get so close to uh, what, you know, the year uh, 1564 or even 1703. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, you, th you know, that building has gone through many different, it was divided into parts, first of all, so that when in his will, Shakespeare indicated that one section of it would be, um, should be occupied by his sister. Yeah. Uh, for the for the you know he was providing her with housing for the rest of her life he took care of all the women in his life his sister included um the other part of it was actually after his father's death um rented to somebody who turned uh turned the rest of it into an inn and then there was a there was an extension to the inn that was built on in the back um and yeah of course there were as you say as there would be in any building a series of occupants a series of different uses, um, a lot of changes over time. And, you know, the building has been stripped back as far as is possible to what was there during Shakespeare's lifetime. Um, so that, you know, a lot of centuries of overlay of other kinds of use and other kinds of um, changes have been stripped away, but it's, it's still uh, an approximation of what it would have been during Shakespeare's lifetime. Yeah, yeah, and good for them. It's, uh, it's good. It's good for the current economy of Stratford. And I, uh, many years ago, uh, studied before it was the Institute, I studied at the uh, Shakespeare at that place, which became the uh, uh, officially the Institute, but we were uh, the same house. And we went to the entire repertoire that year. It was a great year. And oh, I won't yeah. go into that, but it was, uh, I have a great love uh, of that town and just seen it over the time I was there even blossom more and, and just uh, become more and more beautiful and, uh, and other theaters coming in. The Swan uh, wasn't there when I was there. And um, oh yeah, wonderful theater space. Wonderful theater space there, uh, but I could go on and on. I do want to get to your service with you're on committee after committee, and uh, how many of us know your name is your work with the Shakespeare Association of America. There you are, right, with the yearly conference and, and also um, a highly well-organized organization that you were uh, with, and let's see here, you were, yes, from 96 to 2018, no less, uh, you were executive director of the Shakespeare Association of America, and when you started, it was a small group, and having gone to a couple of the yearly meetings, I don't, I mean, you know, it's hard for me to get over at the time that it takes place. Yeah. But uh, uh, I remember going through in Boston 
uh, is one great memory that I have of uh, SAA and what a great conference and seeing people that I hadn't seen in years and saying, okay, I'll see you at the banquet. I'll see you at the banquet. And we went to another hotel in this enormous banquet area and it was packed with people. It was like a, uh, some sort of American football game. And I never saw those people, you know, there was just packed. So it, it's gone from a very small to an extraordinarily large organization uh, and that seems to have occurred, much of which under your leadership. Well, I, you know, I, I mean, I can't take credit for it, but I can. Um, it did, I think, probably about just about double in size over the years. As you say, there were a number of years, it's 22 years. So um, it's over time that those things happened. One of the um, one of my favorite things about working with the Shakespeare Association is that it also had become, and this started before my time under the executive directorship of Nancy Elizabeth Hodge, mm -hmm. had started to become an uh, international destination, an international conference. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a kind of, uh, uh, certainly in the early days, there wasn't any kind of comparable conference, even in the UK. Um, through my work with the Shakespeare Association of America, I also became a member of the board of the International Shakespeare Association. And it's through both the SAA and the ISA that I had some of my most treasured experiences, which was to get to know Shakespeare scholars from and around the world, including many from Japan. You know, I was lucky enough to go to the World Shakespeare Congress that happened in Japan, mm -hmm. um, which was one of the best, uh, one of my uh, favorite memories. Um, from uh, my time of attending Shakespeare conferences. And uh, it's true that the SAA always came at a bad time for Japanese scholars, which was a great regret to me because I had was lucky to have so many friends in Japan. And, you know, I look forward to the time when we can all get together again. Uh, it's been sad. You know, we've missed each other for sad. the past few years. It's been so sad. Uh, and I, you, you know, we all, uh, feel the same way when you're in a situation where people really, really suffer death and death of loved ones, that sort of thing. You feel selfish if you start complaining, but it, it, I don't, it, we're, we're, we've all been punished and we have to, we have to face up to the fact that this has been hard on, on all of us. Uh, and uh, there, there are emotional factors here that are very, very strong. And yes, if we could just get back to I just love, you know, the, the the whole conference environment. The people are so good, and you know, you you make new friends, see old friends, get new ideas, get charged up, uh, and, and we really I just hope that that happens soon. Uh, well, the uh, during this entire time, you were worked as a full time faculty member. Not entire. You're with the Folger, but you were first at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and then you went to Georgetown. So you've had the benefit of living, and I'm going a little bit into your uh, personal life. Now, I know you do private life, but uh, we're showing now that you have not been a private person. You've been a public figure in our field, and uh, thank you so much for your service. But the uh, you, you've had the uh, great uh, benefit and privilege, I, think, I guess, to be in the Washington, D.C. area, your, uh, all of your career, really, and be close to the Folger, be close to all of the resources that are available from various areas through, throughout the Washington, you know, we could just name them all off, including art galleries, you know, uh, uh, world class and theater and all kinds of things. And then you, I'm speaking to you, you're in London now. And not Stratford, but in London. So what takes you to London at this particular time? Uh, well, I started coming to England, as you said, to look at, to travel around, look at um, architecture from the period. Uh, basically what happened was, if I could go back, my dissertation was on a, um, a genre called domestic tragedy. Mm -hmm. And often in those plays, people would refer to my house or this room or that piece of furniture. And I started wondering, what you know we knew it was an empty stage we knew it was a largely bare stage i started wondering what people were imagining in their own kind of 
heads as they heard these things referred to on stage. That's why I started traveling around looking at houses and it developed into an interest in domestic architecture. Um, at some point, the work transitioned into archival work. And so I came to England to look at manuscripts. When I started working on this Shakespeare biography, I didn't know that it was gonna be based in Stratford. I'd written a couple of books about London, set in uh, private life in London. And so I thought, you know, I knew a good bit about London. I imagined that I would be writing about both London and Stratford, but I needed to fill in the gap of going to Stratford to look at records there. And I just kind of got, um, taken over by how much I found in the Stratford records. And so it wound up not being a book about London after all. <laughs> okay. but, uh, but, the other, but the other thing to come to London for, in addition to the resources, resources you know, the Guildhall Library, the National Archives, uh, the British Library, you know, so many great records institutions, there's a theater. There's um, the theater. And, you know, the opportunity to see Shakespeare and his contemporaries. Yeah. Yeah, and there's always something good in London. I, I had the privilege of getting, you know, on, on an exchange program, uh, well, or foreign study program to study in London for a period and and then go back for research during uh, my graduate. And, I, you know, every six weeks, the whole city is renewed. It's like you've gone to see everything you want to see, and then you look, and we used to just go and pick up a Time Out magazine back then. You know, you can search yeah. all this online and just go through, yeah. and they would tell you what to go, you know, it's just instruction. Know. And as soon as you finished that list that you wanted to see, it was all new, there was new things coming out, you know, and just uh, extraordinary. So two of my very favorite places in the world, London and Washington, D.C., and uh, <laughs> aren't, aren't you... Uh, yeah, you, know, you you made your own luck here, but uh, it is a wonderful uh, uh, place to be. Now you're. I feel very lucky, very fortunate. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for noticing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you, it's just wonderful, and <clears throat> your future work. Uh, I think we've gotten into that a bit at uh, with your involvement with Texas A and M. Do you make it down to College Station uh, to? talk with folks there or you do mostly teleconferencing or, or and both um you know i expected to be in residence for longer periods of time at the hagler okay. institute but it's another thing that's been you know kind of interrupted by yeah. the pandemic yeah so um i am looking forward to going uh spending more you know more extended time there in the future at present i'm staying in touch with people mostly as we all are over email and over zoom um, so that, uh, that is something that I'm working on. I'm, uh, also, you know, working on a few other kind of scholarly projects. Um, one of the caches of documents that I came, that I became really interested in in Stratford has, are the private papers of a family in town named Quiney. This is a name that's known to many Shakespeare, uh, scholars because Quiney's son, Thomas, married Shakespeare's daughter, Judith. Um, but that family left behind some uh, private papers that I'm interested in editing. And so I'll have reason to go back to Stratford and, and keep working on um, with those kinds of records as well. So, and are you, uh, you're doing something with the Shakespeare Institute. I saw also in Stratford, uh, you have some sort of involvement there. Uh, along with the birthplace trust. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's specifically the Shakespeare Institute sponsors a conference every other year. It's an invitational conference, um, mm -hmm. so it's for a smaller group, uh, two or three hundred people than uh, some conferences are. Um, but I'm on the co organizational committee for that, okay. which is you know just a kind of advisory board uh, for the organization of the conference. And they're finally after you know. Um, having a year or two off, they're finally hoping to sponsor an in-person conference again this summer, and we hope it happens. We can only hope, and uh, I'm I'm about through with it. You know, I'm I'm uh, finished. I, I um, uh, we've been actually kind of stuck here because although we're very welcome to leave Japan, coming back into Japan has been mm -hmm. over this period of time uh, problematic. And so uh, the university is not really um, uh, allowing business trips 
uh, what, what are called business trips. It'd be academic mm -hmm. trips for me. Mm -hmm. and, and with a uh, enforced uh, two week quarantine, when you come back, it's hard to coordinate getting back in time to meet your classes. Now, once you're in Japan, everything is very free and good and, um, and fine, but they're uh, very uh, strict about leaving and coming back. Uh, it kind of goes back to a sort of Edo men mentality in some ways among the immigration services, not among my colleagues. Uh, all of us, are, all of us are ready to uh, to break free, and uh, oh. <laughs> you know, but you you were okay. you would have to you go to it's pretty fluid, right? You can go you can fly to London. I guess you would fly out of Dulles. Is that yeah? Right? That's right. Yeah, straight. Yeah, to Heathrow. Direct. Yeah. Direct to Heathrow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the, uh, you know, the, the British rules have changed a lot. I mean, the, you know, when I, I did come over here this summer and then I had to quarantine for about 10 days. Yeah. Um, within a few weeks, they had lifted the quarantine. They have a, a lot of testing required. Yeah. yeah. So they expensive, had you know, expensive testing. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but now they're they're fully they're further uh, loosening the rules that'll make travel back and forth easier. Yeah, well, I'm I'm asking you this, and we may be on a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I think we're all interested in it. But you're doing the type of scholarship, and we'll kind of uh, head toward closing with this. When you're looking at houses, you have to go look at houses. It's on mm -hmm. it's on site. Uh, what a what a delightful research project, by the way. I want to go look at some old English houses, and and by the way, I am approved and published, and I am an expert on this stuff. Isn't that nice, you know? But you have to be there. I don't think you could ask somebody to go take a bunch of pictures. It's this experiencing the actual space, looking around. In your case, I'm sure you examined the, to great detail what how things are done, and then you you put people in them. Right. And uh, and explore what that would have been behind those doors with them uh, in their private lives. Uh, and you can't do it uh, remotely as much as we uh, have been benefited from digital work. There are a lot of a lot of things, information you can get and a lot of pictures you can get, too. But without that sense of being on site uh, in London, in Stratford, uh, it's it's impossible. So I'm so happy to see that you can get over there, and uh, and so yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. I think you're. I mean, I certainly felt I really needed to experience the space in order to understand how it worked, how spaces related to each other. I was particularly interested in where people found pri uh, privacy, yeah. And it wasn't in bedrooms the way you would have thought. Hmm. It was maybe on staircases. I mean, you know, um, it really, um, one of the particular spaces I wound up writing about was a space called the Long Gallery. And that was something that developed immediately out of my experience of feeling what those spaces were like. Um, and so it's true. And I, you know, I think with, um, manuscript work as well it's another it's another reason why i've had to come here because as much as we've digitized there's still an awful lot that isn't digitized and you have to actually look at the original documents yes. so and i've been very lucky to be able to work immediately with original artifacts whether they're buildings whether they're furnishings or whether they're manuscript records uh just wonderful well, I am keeping you, I hope I'm not keeping you through breakfast. I hope you had a little bit of breakfast <laughs> before we started. Uh, you're in your morning, I'm in my evening, and uh, uh, I am expected home for supper pretty soon here. But, uh, and we've kept you way too long. Uh, it's just been a joy talking, <laughs> talking with you. The private life of William Shakespeare will make sure to feature the cover of your book and, and uh, have it up uh, on our, the visual part of our program. But for people listening on podcasts, the private life of William Shakespeare, just out making some noise out there. I've noticed in some little boards that I'm on making some noise and there's the, um, <laughs> there's, the, there's the old group that uh, come in anytime you have anything on Shakespearean biography. Uh, and uh, so uh, 
Lena, on behalf of my colleagues, my students, the Japanese taxpayer that uh, has funded this program through a grant, uh, our international audience and everybody, uh, we wanted to thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, safe travels home. Thank you so much. Thanks for finding a time that worked for both of us in spite of our distance. Thanks for bridging the difference with this Zoom. I'm really grateful. Thank you for the chance to talk.